they must realize that they may have given the demonstration of a gift to the world that will provide us energy for millennia. It's important because it starts that whole part of the nuclear story that leads to electrical generation using nuclear power. At 1.23 p.m., low dissipators from the generator were connected. Dash, electricity flows from atomic energy. On December 20th, 1951, near Idaho Falls, a small group of men led by a physicist named Walter Zinn changed the modern world forever by directing electrical current to four simple light bulbs. It was the first peaceful use of atomic energy. Experimental Breeder Reactor Project Number 1, or EBR-1, the world's first fast breeder nuclear reactor was also the first reactor built by the Atomic Energy Commission at the newly established National Reactor Testing Station on the plains near Idaho Falls, Idaho. It would become the most cost-efficient and dramatically effective research tool in the history of the nuclear industry. Everybody had proven that we, we could make a nuclear bomb. But it, had, it hadn't been proven that you could make a reactor work over a protracted period of time safely to do work, uh, peaceful work. Walter Zinn had worked on the Manhattan Project with nuclear pioneer and Nobel laureate Enrico Fermi. Fermi had directed the effort that led to the first controlled nuclear reaction at the University of Chicago in 1942. It was Fermi who encouraged Zinn to explore the new concept in reactor technology. Fermi, who was also at Chicago at the time, uh, was pushing Zinn a little bit on his side, that why not have a fast reactor? Because a fast reactor will generate more fuel than you burn. So you might as well get the whole basket at once. With a uh, normal uh, uh, fission reaction, uh, without uh, any breeding, you only use a very small percentage of the uranium in the Earth. In fact, uh, the only uranium available to you in the Earth is about seven-tenths of a percent of, of that uh, uh, that could be mined. The rest of it would be useless without this concept of breeding. The deposits in the United States and in Canada, I think, were pretty much unknown at that time, and most of the uranium was coming from Africa. So it was thought to be a fairly scarce raw material to start with, which, of course, added incentive to, uh, to, the concept or to the idea that if we're going to use uranium to produce energy, we better use it very efficiently. You have in the core a core that's highly concentrated in fissile isotopes, U-233 or plutonium-239. You surround the core of the reactor with either uranium-238 or thorium-232. And any neutrons that don't get caught up or captured in the fission reaction will find their way out and be absorbed by U-238 or thorium-232 to produce additional fissile isotopes, uranium-233 and plutonium-239. So this process can be made so efficient that you can actually breed more fissile material, plutonium-239, uranium-233, than the original fissile isotopes that you fission. The bulk of the research, design work, and testing for the EBR-1 was done at Argonne National Labs in Chicago in the late 1940s. In addition to physicists, Walter Zinn chose practical engineers for his team, hands-on innovators who were given the freedom to invent. He needed some people on his staff to know how to build things. He had theoreticers that coming out of his ears, and they could analyze the hell out of everything, but they didn't have experience in building things. And I was a builder, and I think he recognized that. We had all these support groups, and they were machining mock-ups, and they were machining the uranium and they were 
welding the cladding. Um, so we learned as we went along and became aware of what other people are doing. And so it was an education for us. Perhaps the most ambitious decision on EBR1 was to use a liquid metal coolant, an alloy of sodium and potassium called NAC, N-A-K, which was highly unstable when exposed to air or water. Using a liquid metal coolant would allow neutrons leaving the core of the reactor to strike the breeding blanket of U-238 at high speed, increasing the potential to breed more reactor fuel. Potassium is, well, it leaves something to be desired if, if you use it a lot. Uh, if you can keep the air away from it, it's quite safe. The NAC would be run through a circulation system that had three-layered tubing to ensure that no water or air could come into contact with the volatile liquid metal. The loop would also be charged with argon gas so that air would not find its way into contact with the NAC. The only the difficult problem, or very demanding problem, has to do with the transfer of heat from a, an alkali metal, sodium or NAC, to water or steam, uh, because those two fluids cannot come in contact. So very special attention has to be given to making leak-tight steam generators, because you, your ultimate product here is, is to produce steam with the heat that's being generated. The EBR-1 and also the EBR-2, which ran for 30 years, never incurred a, a steam leak. We ran loops for roughly four years in Chicago so that everything was tested in a loop in Chicago before it came out here. And uh, there wasn't any doubt that uh, everything was going to run. I, and I believe this was Zin, Walter Zinn's idea. He wanted a, sort of a backup reliability of, um, of cooling of the reactor, even during operation as well as when it was shut down. So what we used was a, what would normally be termed a, a gravity system. The um, coolant to the reactor was stored in a, what we call the gravity tank, which was above the reactor, so that the coolant flowed from this tank through the reactor and then down to a, a drain tank. A pump would pick it up there and pump it up back up to the gravity tank. EBR-1 was designed in such a way that come hell or high water, the cooling would continue. In fact, that reactor was only run on an eight-hour day sh basis. We went home at night. The plant was completely un, unattended, uh, and the, the plant naturally took care of the cooling by natural convection. After four plus years of design and testing in Chicago, Zinn and his team moved the EBR-1 project to Idaho Falls. The National Reactor Testing Station had been proposed by Zinn and established on a desolate stretch of land used by the Navy during World War II to test its big guns. Idaho Falls, then a town of about 25,000 people, was a remote outpost compared to Chicago. I have the impression that the people who were here appreciated uh, an opportunity to be part participating in, an, in another kind of pioneering. Um, I don't know how sentimental people were at the time, but uh, there was a lot of rhetoric around about, you know, this is a, this is a new enterprise, this is science, um, and, and there was a terrific um, feeling of patriotism, I think, also. Construction of the reactor building had begun in early 1950, before Zinn and his team arrived. When I got to Idaho Falls, the construction was nearly completed on the building. The Bechtel Corporation was a contractor, had built a relatively conventional building with sort of special provisions for equipment and so forth. All of the critical reactor, reactor components and, and related equipment was constructed in Chicago. The first offices for the project were in the Rogers Hotel in downtown Idaho Falls. Zinn began hiring local workers to help build the new reactor. Again, he sought men who could solve practical problems. Our local farm boys were 
very ingenious about figuring out how to do things. I think it helped a lot out there because um, the boys from the East knew all of the, how the things were supposed to work, but th they didn't know exactly how to make them work. It was interesting because everybody in them days, you would come into the reactor building, you'd go into the control area, into the change room, everybody wore coveralls. Everybody, engineers and all. You didn't know who was who. There wasn't a man up there that didn't put on a pair of coveralls and pitch in and help. I'll tell you, if you didn't do it, you didn't say. The biggest adjustment the Chicago engineers had to make was the daily 70-mile round-trip commute across the prairie to the construction site. People drove like crazy. The policemen were really, the local police were afraid to be out there. <laughs> we would remove the governors and we would put the drill down into the speedometer so that it pegged at the top, indicating that we were driving at top speed. That was wrong. But that's how independent we were. Building EBR-1 was part science, part seat of the pants, practical engineering. The reactor building had a complete machine shop, and Zinn trusted his team to invent on-the-spot solutions. We had ordered three ion chambers out of Chicago, central shops. They came in, and not a one of them worked. That, and Newman Pettit, he said, well, it looks like we're gonna have to take another three months for central shops to make us up two more. And he stood there scratching his head and he says, can you make an ion chamber? What the hell's an ion chamber? I have no idea. I didn't know an ion chamber from a hole in the wall. And he'd give me his, a drawing. He says, how long will it take you to make them? He says, we need two. I made two of them in five days, and they both worked. By August of 1950, the reactor was completed and its systems ready for initial testing. 48 kilograms of precious uranium-235 had been fashioned into 169 pencil-thin fuel rods to form a core the size of a football. Surrounding the core were 192 rods of natural uranium. The material that would be bred into the usable reactor fuel by neutrons escaping the core reaction. Outside the tank containing the rods was a thick outer blanket of natural uranium bricks forming a cup around and below the core. The cup would be placed on a hydraulic lift so that it could be lowered below the reactor to replace bricks or shut down the reactor in emergency situations. The Argonne National Laboratory had to make a commitment uh, to, the, to the military that if they were given this material, they would be able to return it in usable form, which means it would have to have been reprocessed if, if, after it had been used in a reactor. And, and the laboratory built a facility specifically capable of doing that if the, uh, if the occasion arose. Initial testing began as the reactor was slowly brought up to power. But the 48 kilograms of uranium proved insufficient to take the reactor critical. The Army just gave us what we asked for and we didn't ask for the right thing. <laughs> and we didn't get enough fuel to go critical. So uh, it was our own fault. Uh, but we'd never run a fast reactor before either, remember? <laughs> I hadn't run any reactor before. So uh, it was a learning experience. They had to open up these fuel elements, which you know, uh, tubes with the random slugs inside. They had to open them up. They took the slugs out. They made them a little bit uh, larger in diameter by squashing them. They actually took these little cylinders, which are about the size of a diameter of about a pencil and about three inches long, and they squeezed them a little bit to make them a little bigger in diameter and a little shorter. 
And that made the reactor a little more compact, plus they added uh, some fuel, like I, I think it was about four kilograms, and then rebuilt the fuel lamps and shipped them back to Idaho. The new fuel loading arrived in the fall of 1951, and tests began as the reactor was run closer and closer to critical. Finally, in December of 51, Zinn decided it was time to bring EBR-1 up to full power. We didn't bring the reactor up to power until about 7 o'clock at night. We had sent all the maintenance people home and all the secretaries, and there was only a regular crew that was there, engineers and a few technicians. And we were all sitting inside the control room watching it when they flipped the oncoming line off and flipped it on to the turbine. And we had, they just took it over as sweet and beautiful and then we went out there and wired them four light bulbs to it, plugged them in and they lit up. We were generating our own power. That proved, as far as we were concerned, that we had electrical energy. Um, there was no cheering. It was done. The first peaceful use of atomic energy had been accomplished. In the log, Walter Zinn wrote, at 1.23 p.m., load dissipators from the generator were connected. Electricity flows from atomic energy. Well, in addition to seeing the, the effects of the light bulbs and the electricity, Zinn said we should go put something up on the wall and have everybody sign it. And uh, so I got a ladder and found this space up on the wall that was fairly clear. And, and uh, so I wrote what he said, that for the first time, electricity was generated from atomic energy at this site, December 20th, 1951. And everybody signed it that was there. It was just a little bit too neutral. It ought to have something that would be a little bit more attractive. So I drew this devil-looking figure with wind blowing out of it. And uh, so that's what was written up above there. And then we went home. I don't think that I realized at the time how important it was. No, I really don't. I guess it's because I was young and I, I hadn't been in the field long enough to know what it was all about. And I don't think I realized uh, how, that it was really an important moment in world's history. It wasn't any big deal for us. I mean, you know, it, uh, thank God it's over. <laughs> See, we would spent months trying to get that damn thing up to power. So when it finally got there, <laughs> well, hang on. <laughs> Let's be sure it's going to stay. With the reactor up and running, a new phase of testing began. And as is the case with any new technology, not everything went as predicted. We started running the reactor three shifts a day, um, just to run some time in on the reactor. And we realized that we were losing reactivity at too fast a rate. I mean, you just shouldn't lose reactivity. The physicists were very capable of calculating how much reactivity you ought to lose. And you lose something like, you burn up a gram of fuel a day, and uh, there's a lot of rules of thumb, and we didn't agree with any of those. Reactivity dropped below what was necessary to keep the core up to power. A new fuel loading of 55 to 60 kilograms was ordered from the military. But more critically, every time power was increased, the reactor would surge beyond the desired level and then return to the correct one. 
was suspected to be a mechanical effect, but it needed to be established. So what Dr. Zen decided was to, this ought to be established by experiment. I remember he wrote a letter to the commission explaining that there was a certain amount of hazard result and, he, and some damage might be incurred. Uh, he was given a go ahead to do the re experiment. We were in the process of designing ABR2 and we wanted to know if there was a mechanical effect and if so we wanted to understand it. The experiment was designed to run the reactor with the liquid metal coolant in a static state or not flowing. The core would be overheated to test whether the fuel rods were distorting by bowing inward, causing the fluctuating power levels. They uh, started up the experiment. Uh, they were going to run it for 500 seconds. And uh, they watched the reactivity as the reactor heated up. No flow. Remember that. And uh, finally, it kept getting going up faster and faster and faster. The whole thing was bowing, and they were gaining speed as the power went up. It was going up faster and faster on the curve. So Lichtenberger was there, and he said, take it down. Well, take it down was not in our nomenclature. Well, the operator didn't know what he wanted. I mean, if he wanted a scram, everybody knew what a scram was. There was a handle in the control room ceiling where any one of the seven physicists could have reached up and scrammed it. Nobody had the presence of mind to scram it. So the power went through the point of inflection, started down, then it turned around and started back up. And it started up in earnest. I mean, it was going, moving. And so it melted some of the core. The core of the reactor was badly damaged and had to be replaced, which took nearly two years. Zinn notified the Atomic Energy Commission. He met with some criticism later in the year when the accident was revealed to the public. Zinn was quite disturbed by the fact that there was a sort of a fuss made afterwards, after the experiment, somewhat critical of the, of the fact that the experiment was conducted. And he was disturbed by that because he said, We're, we run experiments to learn things and we learn things. During that meltdown, what happened, instead of the fuel melting and, and, and forming a puddle that could, could go critical again, the fuel actually foamed because it mixed with the coolant and it was self-dispersive. That was a very important feature of what they learned that in fact we exploited later on when we made safety arguments for metal fuel and fast reactors. But what we learned from EBR1 was the beginning of, of the whole thought process of how to make breeders as safe as possible. We discovered that you could make them quote, inherently safe, so that uh, an accident like you had at EBR1 could not happen, could not possibly happen, because it would shut itself down just on physical principles. I believe that EBR1 was the kitty hawk of the nuclear power industry from a standpoint of its real long-range potential, which I firmly believe we haven't even really begun to scratch at this time. It was important because it proved the principle that a nuclear reactor could be controlled and operated in such a way as to generate electricity reliably, ultimately. No, I, I look back at uh, the accomplishment of, of Walter Zinn and, and his colleagues with EBR1 in today's world, and it was absolutely incredible. Uh, and with respect to the people themselves, they were so fortunate to be at the right place at the right time to make such a beautiful contribution to the world. EBR1, the world's first fast breeder reactor, was in operation from 1951 until 1964. And during that time, it was the basis for much of the knowledge we have today on the physics and operation of nuclear reactors.
It was the first to use a sodium-potassium liquid metal coolant, the first to generate electricity from nuclear power, and the first power-producing reactor to use plutonium as a fuel, and at a cost of less than $3 million for construction, it may have been the country's greatest nuclear bargain. It was the key that would unlock a vast atomic resource. There's no doubt in my mind that the technology that these people demonstrated December 20th, 1951, will in fact be one of the true historical accomplishments uh, that we've ever seen. <laughs>